Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can you hear me? Or must I use this? You must. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Basis Project. Uh, the May the 20, uh, oh, July the 22nd, I have to have it written down here. Um, this is a relaxed affair. This is sort of these kind of basis apps are designed for speakers who've never spoken in front of the public before. And Jane is our first one on the runway today. It also is available so that um, people who are experiencers can talk uh, in a more sort of intimate, informal atmosphere. But it is also uh, the virtual anniversary of a very important, a very serious event, the um, murder of Max Spears. Are you okay with that? I'm okay, yes. Okay. So um, that is very serious. There's an awful lot of other things that have happened. I was even speaking with Russian media people only a few, about a week or so ago. Uh, so this has hit a chord. The key to this is, the basis project, I insist, do not believe it. It is not something you said believe in. It's information you take account of. It's not a belief system. And when Barry King over 25, 26, God knows, 1994, 1993, started talking about man-made aliens in a base in Berkshire, not too far from here, it's been a long time coming since I've heard from different sources that they've been doing things like that at Boscombe Down. We now know, after all that time, they've been making cyborgs in, since the, before the war, in the, with World War II. Uh, they had rejection issues, but they've got it better and better and better. And we now are being warned that, according to Elon Musk, humanity faces existential extinction. Now, existential extinction means we're finished. If, but if the penny hasn't dropped, this isn't me talking, this is Elon Musk we now know from sources that Elon Musk has been given access to the underground base network in the UK. He's going to have spaceports, we understand. And I suggest those are for landing rather than liftoff. But we all know that the chemical rocket stuff is a load of baloney. This is just making what is already happening a little bit more public. Hyperspeed underground tunnel networks. The main network uh, hub here, one of the main hubs is Manchester. You turn left at Manchester, you go under Ireland, you go to the States. You turn right at Manchester, you go to Russia. This is a hyperspeed tunnel network, and he'll be selling that to you as, as a feature you can, you can get involved with. Everybody also can judge that the population is a ra a rather large. They're, they're dumbing us down. The media is fully involved with this. And there's all sorts of other things going on. But one of the earliest spe uh, people I interviewed at the, at the basis, on Basis 2 was a guy called Ron Adams, who was being my labbed at Bentwaters. That's the Bentwaters Rendlesham Forest Twin Base. But one of the terrible things happening to him there was that he kept on coming back with this terror of spiders. And more and more information on that is coming forward. Big things that would fill half of this room. So we have a problem, and we have a problem with dimensional issues. And only a few weeks ago, John Lear mentioned to Kerry Cassidy about a story about Vietnam, about huge eight-legged things. The question was, is it any, is it any worse than he, like the movie An Alien? And John Lear says, yes, <laughs> and laughed. You can't get any worse than an acid-blooded alien that refuses to die and uses human beings as hosts. Anyway, that is one of the key things about the Vietnam War. That's what they were actually fighting, the Vietnam War. Well, a little bit after that, there was um, uh, another little war called the Falklands War. And we uh, know, I've got to get this in. Uh, uh, oh, Colin isn't here. No, Ben. Ben, I'm going to say it, OK? Is, are, you, are you ready for this? I'm ready. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about the black goo. Now, the thing about the black goo is it ended up in the, in the deaths of quite a few scientists. Does anybody know the origin of the black goo as far as the Falklands War are concerned? Okay, one of the key spoils of war, if not the reason for the war, was to gain access to underground tunnels of blue ice in the, in the Antarctic region, and that was Thule Island. Now, there's a Thule base in near Greenland, the Nazis named it Thule. So why does the Nazis have a North Pole Thule and a South Pole Thule? 
because they can go between the poles. Maybe there's a hollow earth thing. You know, Admiral Byrd ran into that. Anybody know about the story by Admiral Byrd? Yeah. Well, guess what? Admiral Byrd had a cousin. He was called Dry Hold, Dry Hold Bird. He was an oil man. And he owned a certain book depository. The penny dropped anywhere there? No. Well, some guy called Lee Harvey Oswald, who was CIA, was accused of using a rifle to terminate some guy he thought he ran the United States. Admiral Byrd's cousin owned the book depository that the CIA had their snipers at whilst they shot Kennedy while Lee Harvey Oswald hung about waiting to be arrested for the crime. Anyway, that's a distraction in some regards. The point is that further information on that uh, find of uh, extraterrestrial intelligent fluid, which was brought to this country by sea in large containers, a certain number of them, which I won't mention, the source here may wish to elaborate on that. That's entirely his choice. But we are dealing with an extraterrestrial visitation on this planet, which we are all extraterrestrials. We've got predators. We've got a busy planet. We've got to wake up because something wants us to sleep. And while we sleep, we die. So in the meantime, there are other stories to be told from the higher ones. Those upstairs. Jane, Jane's mother knew a few things, and Jane knows a few things as well. So for the first time, Jane, do you want to say you had a relative here once you met at the three first bases at the barge? Oh, gosh. Well, well I'm not, he wasn't really a relative, actually. He was a ward for my cousin. I think. I think. You're talking about guy, a guy who's, who's a ward currently of Her Majesty's prison. Yes, at yes. Earl Stoke, I think I knew him when he was five. Well, that man is James Casbolt, and James Casbolt was a close connection with Max. And with that, ladies and gentlemen... I only met gentlemen, him once. Only met him once. Yes. Right. Um, sorry, I'm parodying you when I said that. <laughs> it's very rude to parody somebody who's actually here. Right, ladies and gentlemen, James Shattuck. And we'll break for lunch after that, and then we'll uh, have Vanessa. Lunch will be about an hour and a half, so relax and enjoy yourselves at Devises, the Black Swan Hotel. Right. I hope, can everybody... <laughs> right, I hope everybody can hear me. I've written a book about reincarnation, and I'm going to call it How We Are What We Are, because I'm trying to explain how reincarnation works. At the moment, we just don't really have a clue. People say, oh, my grandson's a really old soul. He's probably lived before. Or um, you get people saying, well, you only live once. No, you don't. It probably, according to my information, probably takes a million years for a human being to be created. And we all do start off in pondweed. It just goes on and on. But I'll go on to that later. And anyway, the way we got the information was via my mother. And my mother was quite... Well, a, a more than good-looking naval officer's wife. She went to. She was never really interested in cocktail parties and things. Or, no, that's perhaps a lie. She was, but she she really liked her painting, and she never really sort of did anything that all the other naval officers' wives did. You know how it was in the sort of 50s and 60s, women didn't work, you married your husband, you, you gave dinner parties, you took the children to school, you perhaps belonged to the wives' club. Well, my mother was never into that. She was into her painting and her different things. And then we were out in Singapore, and we came back, and it was, was 1973, so I was 20. And I was going up to London with my father, and suddenly my father, we were on the train, and my father said, you know, mommy's had some visions. She's had this spiritual experience. And I have to say, I thought at the time, why did she tell him? But then why wouldn't she? <laughs> He's her husband. But my father, we thought differently in 1973. We none of us thought about reincarnation. We thought, of, we all had a sort of woolly belief in religion of some sort. But if you said to anybody, you've lived before, oh, no, I'm not going to come and do this again, am I? You know, we never, ever really thought about anything like that. And people would be, think you were mad. So I have to say, it didn't come to my mother in that way uh, to begin with. And now I know more about my mother's 
history through the ages, she, poor woman, has been a holy woman three times, which I don't think is a great thing. But in 1973, it was the way it was. So she literally woke up, or believed that she had woken up somewhere, talking to this man in 17th century garb who kept explaining to her that the world was in danger, that she must know all this information, she must do exactly as she was told, and then kept asking her, do you understand? Do you understand? It turned out that my cousin, as a very small child, saw this same man, and also, my, I feel quite cheated, I've never seen him. Anyway, my, after this period of time, my mother then had a series of visions. One was the Holy Ladder. She woke up with all these people shouting, and I don't know if you can see that, Miles, can you? It's a huge picture, which I have at home. It was actually, it, this is supposed to be all these people on the other side pointing, and there's my youngest sister in her best nighty, playing the part of human ignorance, all sort of tied down. And it is a very interesting a picture. Right. That's just a print of it. It's huge. I couldn't possibly bring it. She later on was shown this man again. It was all very kind of ancient. In 1973, we thought differently. The same 17th century man, what he was supposed to be representing was that in our knowledge, in the way we think, we're coming out of the 17th century. So he was holding up a veil here against the face of evil. So it's not to meant to mention about the devil or any kind of religious thing. It's just saying that we take everything as we see, but there is great evil going on. And there are certain people uh, who are trying to give us this message. So after a while, they started talking about reincarnation and explaining. And I have to say, when my mother was alive, I never actually read any of her stuff. And then she then she became very ill. She had Parkinson's disease, and she became very confused. We moved house, and then I started finding all these things. And my mother was trained as a, um, as, a as a secretary, so she had left all these papers written in triplicate about all kinds of things, about how the world should be, how there should be trees in certain places, how human beings are created. Um, about different herbal cures that we could use, so many things. And I have, to, I have to get it all together. There's too much to put in one book. So I, after she died, I found that I also have her gift, not in the same way, but not, and not as, perhaps not as strongly. I work as a physiotherapist. I have, I'm trained as an acupuncturist, and I have quite a powerful ability as a healer, which I'm finding as I get old is, uh, <laughs> is very tiring. And I rushed across to help a friend of mine who appeared to be having some kind of heart issue. And I have to say, it's left me for the last three days feeling shattered. So I haven't really sort of planned this properly. However, what I've done is I've written in this book, I've written about how it all came to my mother and how she, first of all, tried to go to the church about it. And you would think, wouldn't you, that the church would be interested in somebody who has a message from the other side, particularly, you know, something very interesting. But, I, but the church is like parliament. It's, it's political. And I think that our very nice little vicar who really did believe that my mother had something. Um, really, in the end, he was warned off by everybody, and he, he backed away. She went to all sorts of people and got nowhere with it. I think I even, um, I think she had some warning from the Bishop of Guildford, who is now no longer with us. And I was about 22 or something at the time, and I got an interview with him. And, and I was so unimpressed with him when I took my mother I took my mother in the car and I went in to see him and he was nervous of me. And then I said, um, my mother's in the car, why don't you see her? She's nice, you know, and she's got all this information you should hear about. People should know about it. And uh, I noticed that he was nervous. And then when he saw that my mother was also nervous, he took the initiative and completely demolished her. And I just thought, so much for men of the church. You know, where are we going with this? And at the time, you know, it, it was all about Ireland and all the terrible things that were going on in Ireland. And they had this idea that my mother would send this message to all the bishops, which we did, and, 
you know, that we would have, that there would be, people would go in and say a, a prayer for world peace, and they would leave a little bit of money. And the money would be given in Advent to all the widows in Ireland. And I thought, what a lovely idea. That would be, you know, and there would be a little box at the back of the church made by school children, which said, nothing so promotes the course of evil as human indifference. And I thought, well, that would be a lovely idea, wouldn't it? And everybody would pray for world peace and, you know, we'd all leave a bit of money. And it would promote good feeling between Ireland and England that we cared. And it might do something. And if it was given by the church... Anyway, it never happened. And now we carry on blowing each other up and more and more at each other's throats. And so never mind, it hasn't happened. However, as time went on, she's got all these messages and one thing and another and after she died I started to get some very different stuff and it's been a very difficult book to write because we are so complicated as people so what they're saying is basically if you leave that jar of water on the side over there after a while it'll start to go green and then you'll get sparanjara that sort of weed that grows. And that weed will not just be weed in water, it'll be little microbes that help its my metabolism. It'll be, um, it'll be doing something, it'll be cleaning the water and it'll also be moving forward in life. Gradually, certain parts of it, which will continue, you'll get the amoeba, which is the first stage of humanity. So you get a little protoplasmic body and you get a nucleus and then you get the little... Pod, what do they call them, podicles or whatever, and which is the, the forerunner of, of life. And it will split, make two, and it goes on and on until eventually its little entity, it'll have a physical body and a spiritual body, and it will be combined to make something else. And this goes on and on and on until you get a male and a female of a species which mate together to make something. That will then, um, each one of those, the male or the female, will give a layer of brain cells to each one of their progeny. That then goes on and on until you get to the end of that stage, and then you fuse a male and a female of a particular creature, and that will then go on to be something bigger. It'll be either male or female. And it goes on and on through all the different creatures where we actually fuse different creatures together. If you want to see an example of some sort of a progression, you could look, say, for instance, at a mouse. Look at the mouse's back legs. The mouse doesn't prey on anything. It has numerous babies. It goes on, and it gets preyed upon. Then it goes on to be perhaps a rat, and that may actually go on to be a cat. And you look at the back legs the way they are. So everything goes on to planets. So every, everything goes on being combined and combined and combined until you get to the ape stage. And all humanities, and our humanity on this planet now is a mess. Because whatever happened, we don't... We're probably our present civilization is only really a few thousand years old, maybe 10,000, we don't know. I mean, there are various people who are writing about what was going on. Say the Indians know that they had a much more, you know, much more advanced civilization, maybe... 10,000 years before going back, they've had their message. They were flying around in their Vamanas. And there's a lot of message. There's a lot of uh, knowledge in their Mahabharatas and their Vedas. And then there seems to have been, you know, all the stories of Atlantis and different things that we have now that have, um, that just disrupted the whole world. So we've been left trying to think how to go forward. And I'm losing my way because my brain is knitting. Anyway, um, so what I've done is I've tried to put a little bit of the um, history of this present civilization, which there must have been other people here before these aliens or gods or whatever that are in all our um, history came. But we really don't know much about it. You know, you, there, there are things in the Bible which, um, which pertain to 
people flying around in spaceships. There's a bit in, in Genesis, and I think, I think it's Isaiah, isn't it, who says he's working on the, on the side of the river, in, of the river Chaldea with other men, when a whirlwind comes out of the east and the, car, the clouds part, and there's this... He's, you know, in old-fashioned language, with a sound like rushing water and marching armies, this thing appears with a lot of smoke and fire, and the people move well back. And there are people there, sort of dressed. He, his expl explanation is quite difficult, but it's, it, William Bramley's quoted it. Lots of people have. So there are lots of things. What about Yahweh with the Jews? So there obviously has been some sort of breeding program, not just with us, but with many, many civilizations in the world. And so now we've got a whole lot of different people who are different races. We're now, because we're moving around, starting to mix ourselves up very much. So I went down to Somerset recently to a school reunion, and uh, I saw a lot of friends down there. And I've always wondered where the rhesus negative comes from in our family. My younger sister is rhesus negative. And there are various traits that go with rhesus negative blood. There are roughly only 15 percent of the population who have it, you cannot, even, say you're B rhesus negative, you cannot accept or give blood to somebody unless they are also negative, because your blood will kill it or try to. So people who are rhesus negative tend to have an extra lumbar vertebra, so I have the trait, I have an extra lumbar vertebra. They have, tend to have very low blood pressure, very low um, heart rate. I, I have a feeling they have very sort of deep hip joints as well. And we think that only the Vikings had this. But in fact, I was treating somebody the other day, and she said the majority of people on the island of Mauritius have, have rhesus negative. And I've, I'm not sure whether Easter Island was another place. So it, it looks as though somebody has done various breeding programs around the world. So we now get on our in, into an airplane and we go off and we have um, we think everybody belongs to the ABO section, you know, um, blood groups we don't a very nice English seeming chap who'd been in the army, he still had his blood card from the army he was D rhesus negative so, and a lot of black people are G's and F's and H's. So we're mixing ourselves up, and this is what is causing us to be fat, have diabetes, various cancers, because what happens is that the body starts to swell in various places. So with people who have the rhesus negative in their system, like me, you very often have this situation where you have some body systems which need to work on a high blood pressure and some on a low. So as you get older, it means that I've always been slightly fatter than I'd like to be. It, it often gives the pelvis as an area for great power in the human body, if you're looking at the way the chakras work. So you find that certainly with women particularly, you know, things like fibroids, um, endometriosis, and all manner of problems start to occur, very difficult periods, so it, which makes having children very difficult. So, and I do quite a lot of that, so I see quite a lot of these things. So we've now, the only way that we can go forward is to realize how important race is. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but there was a man, I think he was Emmanuel Khan, I think he was, um, I think he was an Armenian. And he, um, he, was, he made a lot of money before the First World War in Paris. And he used his money and he sent people all over the world to photograph how people were before the First World War. And you realize how tribal people were. They were if they had a horse, that horse was used for tilling the fields. If they had a cow, you know, they, they, you know they were, we were much poorer. We didn't travel much. I mean, even my own grandfather, I don't think he came. I don't think he, I think he went to Lyme Regis for one day on his, um, on his honeymoon. And the rest of the time, he was in Taunton. He never went anywhere. So people's blood tended to stay in the same place. But now that we all get on airplanes and we move around, and the First World War was a terrible disruption. Why did we go to war? Because somebody killed Franz Ferdinand, and we had some stupid pact. And they reckon, I think it was 12 million people were killed. That's just a conservative estimate. And 
people were shoved around and moved and all these sort of tribal things were broken up. People were, had sex and married people with completely out of their blood group, out of their system. The health problems that have come to me, I reckon that my, on my father's side, I reckon that my grandmother on my mother's side, on his mother's side, uh, probably one of her grandparents was black. I'm sure they were lovely. But Bristol was a big slaving port. So once the poor things arrived here, they were free to go and have sex with whoever they wanted. And it's interesting now, going back, I'm now 64, and the girls who were in my class, the amount of illness and how many children are being born into their family who are not right. And a lot of, we think Shattock, my surname, is Schudelcock. So it was probably a Flemish weaver who came over, in, I think, in the ninth century and had nine sons. And a lot of that area in northern France and, and Belgium and some going into Switzerland and also Sweden, and I think they reckon 60% of the British public have some Viking blood, if not a lot of it. Our accents up in places, um, where am I thinking of? Up in Northumberland, which was very vi Viking. You know, that hurdy-hurdy accent is, is very Norwegian. And... So we think so. A lot of us have this rhesus negative plus black ancestry, so, which is causing problems like um, rheumatoid arthritis, various cancers, um, pff, all manner of of problems that are starting to come. And my friend I was staying with, two of her out of the four children, have some kind of neurological problem. One of her brothers is dead, and her other sister is fifty seven and is have, starting to have trouble. But this is going on all over the country, but it's going on all over the world. And really all we can do now is that when people marry each other, if they take some blood from the father, take some blood from the mother, put it in a slide and see if it mingles. So if the first thing, if your blood is right, then you can perhaps... There are, in the future, there will probably be many of us who will... I mean, I've not had any children. I'm, I'm not sorry about it now. I love children, but... I don't think I would have wanted to pass on what, you know, the health problems I've had. And I think many of us going forward and many of our children will find this. But so many, many of us have had so many different lifetimes. I mean, doing the work I do, I have so many people who tell me extraordinary stories about reincarnation. So if you're, th if you're thinking to yourself, all of you out there, well, have I lived before? Yes, you've probably lived once or maybe even twice in every century since for, forever. And I was out to dinner with a friend of mine. We went to see a film, and she brought along a friend she, she had studied acupuncture with. And this girl was asking me about myself, and I said, well, I've just written this book about reincarnation. She said, oh, let me tell you my reincarnation story. And she reckoned that she'd had this extraordinary rein, uh, this extraordinary dream which kept recurring and she dreamt she was a roman woman and she was walking along in her stola and it was a wet street and this man was coming towards her and she knew that he was her lover and he was a he was a what do you call it he was a yeah the word and not all of them were just slaves they were rock stars in those days. Anyway, he had betrayed her. And he came towards her, and she pulled a knife from under her dress, and she killed him. And this dream kept coming back. And then one time, she was with her second husband, and her marriage was beginning to go on the rocks. And they were in some bar or restaurant or something, and she was standing at the bar next to this man, and he turned around, and he said, I know you. And she felt she knew him. And he, his relationship broke up and hers relationship broke up. And they didn't actually start a love affair, but they stayed friends. And they used to go out together. And one time he was in her flat with her. and They were sitting there sort of talking. And he, suddenly she said the light went around them went sort of pinkish. It was very strange. And he said, what's going on? And then he looked at her and he said... You killed me. You murdered me. And she realized he was the one. That's, she knew him. He knew her. So I've often met people who I've just felt I knew altogether. I've known them before. And I think we all have that.
And actually, if we start to look around at the people who are the most significant in our lives, if we start to look at our family tree, you often find that there are similar names. I even think some of my patients are the same. So I've tried to explain how we're created, how we go through different races, different everything. And if you're going back to my mother, oh, this is hard, this stool. Oh. Um, my mother and I went to a thing in, um, when was this, about 20 years ago, in the British Museum. And they'd brought over some mummies from Rome. And these were people in the first century who were Roman, who had gone to um, Egypt for trade and one thing or another. And they all looked like Arabs. They were all very dark. None of them had lived very long. W about 50, year, 50 lifetimes ago, most of us would have been dark brown. And we would, you know, we're all emerging. And each lifetime, you get another layer of brain cells. You notice if you... Um, look at a European's head, we have different lumps and bumps. Our heads are irregular because we inherit another layer of brain cells. And we, each one of us move on. People like, um, people like Mozart. Mozart, I believe now, is Nigel Kennedy, a man with an incredibly, um, what can you say, incredibly um, musical mind. And sometimes I think people get, get these things in the same way I'm getting this information. And he's gone back to where he came from in Poland, which was, I think, partially Germany in those times. And he's that sort of person. He writes different music now. The man who was um, Handel is now Howard Goodall. And he, before that, he was, um, he's had two lives as musicians. So we all go on. But we can, because we're so mixed up now, I mean, I think Obama, who we made a big thing about, Obama, this black president, Obama's half white, half black, and I think he was Lincoln last time, and he may not have lived since then, so his mind is still in the American Civil War. But the, way you, the only way you can actually tell is the way people wear their bodies, the way they move. So I don't think there's any film of him, but you can see, you know, the way he stands, very erect. So... I've, I've tried to explain about reincarnation, and then I've gone on to talk about the things that concern us very much now, like um, all these different diseases which we are being um, inoculated against. What causes it? What causes polio? Well, we're beginning to realize that polio actually is shit in the water. So in the past, in Victorian times, before Bazalgette came along and built beautiful um, sewers, was absolutely filthy. I think in the mid 1860s, we had to. The Parliament had to move out. And it wasn't until Parliament had to move out of um, the Parliament, the, you know, the buildings, because of the smell in the Thames, that they started to do something about it. But even now, we're putting huge amounts of raw sewage into the sea, into the water, everywhere. Um, probably smallpox was almost definitely shit in the milk. If you look at the way milk was produced in the past, you had a dairy maid who was busy. And if the cow shat in the bucket at the same time, I mean, you probably just waited for it to drop to the bottom and then just served it up. So people were incredibly filthy. And it wasn't, I, um, it wasn't until they discovered that so many of these um, dairy maids had this cowpox, which was similar that they, be able, well, they were able to go forward with it. So I've put a lot of things in. One of the things, my mother had Parkinson's disease. One of the things, that's an own goal for humanity. And my information is that Parkinson's disease was caused by the First World War gas. The First World War gas, I think it was by 1917, one in every four shells that was shot up into the sky was, um, was a gas shell. And where's that going to go? So it flowed around the world. And we, nobody was really watching at the time. You could be well in the morning, you could be dead by the evening. And they were terribly upset. Why was it so many children were killed? But you think, even in my child, you put your tiny baby outside in all weathers to get fresh air, didn't you? So in those days, there you were in one of these filthy towns with everybody having... Everything was covered in coal smoke in my youth. 
So then you put your tiny baby out there breathing the coal smoke, but also, if there was a cloud of gas coming across, that also. And the first person to write an account of the First World War flu was a Captain Ivory, whose, uh, whose people had just served in the trenches in France. And 70% of his men were ha having this very strange flu. And it's not like any flu we've ever had because you started to, um, your lungs started to fill up with this black fluid. When the end of your nose went blue and your ears and your hair might, might go white overnight, they knew you were going to die. So maybe 50 million people around the world have died of this World War flu. The unfortunate thing about it is that it affects the nervous system very seriously. So, um, people who have been damaged by it, and my mother used to say to me, they say there'll come a time when I can hardly be able to walk. But I, nobody had any idea what it was going to mean. And then gradually, she went into this Parkinson's disease. And unfortunately, sometimes with Parkinson's, because it has affected the heart, and we're now beginning to realize that the heart is so amazing, your heart can beat outside your body without any help. Your heart stores your likes, your dislikes, your tastes. It affects your sight very much, it, your, your hearing, it, uh, you know, the color of your tongue. And people who've had heart transplants often take on the likes and dislikes and the personality of the person who has given them the heart. So. People like my, certain people like my mother, not everybody, because it affects everybody differently, start to find that they become very stiff, their voice falters, and then they start getting more and more confused. So sometimes my mother would be herself, and other times she was not knowing who I was. And it's an, a hideous thing for everybody, anybody to go through. But now, because of the wickedness of those people who have been running our country in the past, our countries, we were that wicked that we set off these gas shells. So now we rule the day that we now have it. So it, and it's not all old people who get it. Some people are getting it in their 20s because you, you do a, have a repair on the other side. Purgatory purge to purge so that when somebody dies you go to the other side and your entity which is what goes on your entity is purged of whatever it is that you've been taking or whatever's happened to you but there are some times when people are repaired as well as they can on the other side and they have to send them back knowing that they will be ill because it is it's how your entity cures itself if you um there, there's, there is a machine where they can actually look at your aura. And there was some work done on it. I don't know whether they're still doing it, but there was some work done on it in America and in Russia. So they've done various things, like that. You know, you'd find a little flower, uh, you know, a leaf, and you cut it in half, and the aura of the, cut, the piece you've cut away is still there. Cut a hole in the middle, and there's another leaf. So if a leaf is a, has a multidimensional aura, what about us? So they've done things with a salamander, and I remember them in Singapore, you know, those sort of chit-chats we used to call them, fighting on the ceiling and sitting there with my coffee and one of its tails. <laughs> my coffee was really freaky and horrid, but it'll grow another one. So it's a really simple little creature. But they found in the fertilized egg of a salamander, around it was the adult creature, or the aura of the adult creature, and it was sort of growing this very basic creature. We are the same. So, first of all, when your, your parents have had their, done their, their deed and the little embryo starts to form inside you, once it divides, and until there's a little perfect body, there's nothing there. But at 13 weeks, when we call it the quickening, when the child is put inside you, that's when the entity, your entity, us, our soul, whatever, that starts to grow the person. If your entity has been very damaged and they can't see, because we are multidimensional, I don't fully understand it. Um, you know, some, some people reckon that your brain exists on seven different structures. I'm not quite sure what those structures are as yet. I'm plowing my way through um, some of Rob Sang Rampa's books at the moment, but I don't think he's interested. Um, but I don't, I don't think that he has, uh, he has the whole truth at either. You know, I think he was apparently sent to the West to give us a message, and some of his stuff is great. 
but some of this I think is very confusing. Anyway, um, so I've, I've covered things about different illnesses. I've covered what causes um, a man to want to be homosexual or a woman. Um, sex change. And sex change, again, is another own goal for humanity. Because really, if you look back through all races, there have been many times when small boys are castrated before they go into, before they develop properly. In the, between the 17th and, well, the 15th and, the, and recent times, I think the last one died in 1910. There were, in 1896, I think there were three of them in the Vatican choir. And your, all, your, all your hormones grow your human body, and they grow you. Puberty is quite a painful time for, for human beings because we're going from being a child to, a, to an adult. Our bodies are developing, our minds are developing. So they were very aware with these um, castrati that they, they were always given a diminutive name because they didn't grow properly, and they grew to be freaks. You know, the head wouldn't grow properly. They, they would grow enormously tall. They'd, have these, they'd practice for ages, so they'd have these big barrel chests. So they'd have the, man, the, the man's chest and the man's ability to breathe. But this little piping voice, and they were freaks, and only maybe six of them ever really achieved any fame. A lot of them were castrated to save a voice that was never worth saving in the first place. A lot of people did it because they were hoping t that their child would make them a lot of money. And, but the problem is, whatever happens to you in each life, you keep the impressions. You don't necessarily know what's happened to you, but you keep the impressions. So a lot of these poor people are now here, perfectly normal men who are living normal lives. Many of them, and many of them, most of them, are heterosexual. And they go and... They get married, they have children, but become more and more disturbed by the fact that they feel they should be a woman. And I suppose all you can say is that they have to get it out of their system, but the, probably the best thing to do is not to go and have the operation because the operation is so damaging to the human entity, to the body, everything. So, um, you know, we are now in a very confused state. Our, the way we think is very much... Um, our minds are being changed all the time, not only by events, but by the media, by the government, by various people who get into power. And it's often the most dysfunctional people who shout the loudest. And we'll not, perhaps not be um, very happy about it, but we won't say anything because we don't want to be racist, homophobic, sexist, whatever other ist there is that comes into into um, situation. Anyway, I'm, um, I'm just running, I'm grinding to a halt here. Um, anyway, my mother's stuff includes things about water-based engines, um, herbal remedies that we can be using, how the world's weather is affected by what we grow, the fact that skyscrapers are the most seriously dangerous thing for our planet. Um, Nothing should be, you know, we really need to think very carefully about what we place on the Earth's surface. As everybody's beginning to suspect, it's largely a hollow Earth. And we have, according to my sources, there are a series of sort of four engines that are like a spinning top going up through. And maybe it also has other dimensions, like Admiral Byrd has. I've seen these things on the television. I don't know. One thing I did notice, see, it was something I was watching yesterday, and he was, being, he was being interviewed by Roosevelt, I think, wasn't it? And he was there in his uniform, and he was, he was absolutely, without his hat on, his flying gear, he was completely the perfect Aryan example. Very blonde hair, very good looking. And you wonder if there was something else behind that, really. Anyway, so... I've got a little bit of stuff that my one thing which which my mother was dicta was dictated to my mother, and one thing which was the introduction of what she was going to say. So I think I'll finish by reading that. And if I falter a bit, it's because she wrote it on a very old um, typewriter, and um, quite often there's bits of crossings out, and I can't quite. 
or she's put the wrong words, or there's a great lump of tap, tip X, which doesn't help. So anyway, this is her introduction. And this is where she's putting a little bit about Jesus Christ in it, which I've kind of avoided. Right. So this is the story of what most people would call a spiritual experience. Or to put it in another way, it could be described perhaps as an intrusion into my life. An attack or a contact made upon me or to me by men, as they claim to be, who are no longer alive and who were determined to tell their story to a living person. It's a very, very strange story, but the message which has been given to me, I believe, could be of vital importance to every living planet in our every living person in our planet. And if true, once thoroughly researched, could add tremendously to our knowledge and help to make our planet a very much better place for everyone to live in. To give the reader the complete picture of myself, which I believe must be important to the whole book, I begin with a short synopsis of my own life, from the very first moment when I have memories of my own childhood. I must stress in this introduction that I began my present life as a member of the Church of England and have always adhered to this faith and encouraged my three daughters to do the same. I could not possibly have invented the story which follows, nor the dictations which have been given to me, directly and into my mind, so that I can write them down quickly, in the shorthand that I learned as a girl stenographer. Dictations which include impassioned pleas for understanding by what is claimed to be Jesus Christ himself, standing on trial for his future, or his very life, and the comments of others who claim to have placed him there and accused him of keeping his planet in ignorance for thousands of years and of being directly the cause of the last two disastrous wars as all part of his personal plan to oppose those sent to rule our part of the universe. All this and very, very much more will be found to amaze the readers of this book. So that was the beginning of some of her stuff, but I've got to get it together and there is so much, it's very difficult. Now, this is something she's taken down from the other side, and I've lost the last page, but I'll find it maybe somewhere. Let, of all, let all of those who read this book come to know that all the ensuing chapters are being dictated directly to the writer by the unseen, those who desperately wish the living to have complete and true knowledge, without which this planet will fail, as have millions, possibly billions of other planets similar, elsewhere in this vast, enormous, fantastic universe. Everyone knows of, owns, but rarely reads the ancient Bible, the old message for this planet of the planet Earth. What does it tell the people who read its millions of beautifully written words? Who wrote this book of history and legend? For that, in truth, is mostly what it is. It's been said already to the writer who has the physical hands that are putting our words to paper so that the world may read them, that the holy book Holy Bible is more correct in the Old Testament than in the New. This is true, and we shall in the chapter on the Christian religion attempt to piece together the real truth about Jesus himself and the ancient people who formed the old Roman councils, who at their wit's end decided eventually, after three or four, possibly four hundred years, to adopt Christianity, do away with all the old ancient gods and idols, and substitute new ones. All too many of these... Um, bore strong resemblances in every case to their ancient gods and goddesses and the rituals and ceremonies that had gone before and which their people were used to, not to mention tortures and exhortations of all kinds to keep the people under subjection. The Roman Catholic Church was born. The Old Testament, too, we believe, has a strong link with lost ancient histories of far distant past. Whole peoples possibly were destroyed and their residue forced to take to the boats and try to find refuge in the new lands far away from their origins and birth, which must account for the famous legend of Noah's Ark. We must mention also, too, not only Jesus, but Muhammad and Buddha, who have all played an important part in this planet's history. In our carefully, con oh, in our carefully constructed book, all of these leaders are now living again, as is their wish, and new governments are forming to govern this planet. In loving harmony... Can you stop doing that? It's really off-putting, sorry. In loving harmony of all the different and various um, family clans... I think maybe there's uh, Mr. Page here. What they're saying is that we all belong to family clans and that it's those people who love us and look after us. And we should be born within all those things. So, uh, so I think I've lost pages two and three. So in lo Loving Home, with all the different various family clans, a truly happy marriage, the basis of all life. This is true happiness and goes on in life after death. Young people of today desperately need help to find the right partner for life, for this 
we intend to talk about in depth. Prayers of the needy and desperate cannot be answered by some impossible God in shining armor seated astride the universe and listening with compassion to every single one of the billions who pray to him. No, it's love, the love of family clans that draw near to the living and brings them to true joy, helps them in life, tries to answer their prayers and cries for help, and guides them after death to their loved ones waiting for them. All of this will be explained and how prayer works. Our message is only the same as that written in all religious writings from the dawn of time, but coupled with knowledge and instruction. We hope that millions reading it will come to think deeply about it all themselves. We hope that the very wealthy seeing a need will help the world in various ways and see their way clear to use their wealth to help their less fortunate fellows and not hide their wealth away in banks as so many are doing now. The importance of royal families now in your planet are almost no royal families excepting in England where this book is being written and wherein the message will begin. This is a great tragedy. The role of royal families all over the world must be explained and what it is that they, may, they must try to do to help to keep the peace between nations and treat with nations altogether in peace above politics. Create wonderful, wondrous spectacles and ceremonials meant to bring joy and national pride to the ordinary people. All this must be put in the book. The writer of this book is just like many thousands of others, both living and not living. I mean, they reckon my mother was a royal person, but actually she's had several lives as saints, which haven't really been that great. Um, deprived of her true status and played, um, placed in an ordinary life, she's done this task before in her sister planet with great success. Um, they're saying also that our doctors are abysmally ignorant. And, oh, I can see, which we can see here. Um, and I can find here now that I have got the page two and three. Can you bear it if I go back? Yeah, okay. Um, and then I've lost the last page. This is very organized, isn't it? Right, okay. So, without true knowledge, all humanities eventually destroy themselves, sometimes hostilities of nations turning their backs upon true, nation, true knowledge, coupled with the apathetic disinterest of the people, also eventually destroy civilizations altogether. We hope to save this planet and see it march to a new and wonderful future, providing a home for billions of splendid people. The reader must come to realize that life is re what life is really all about and that it is worth striving for and even dying for as so many in complete ignorance believing only in religious sort of paradise have done before. It's difficult for us not to repeat ourselves at times as all things relate to the whole. But we can only say that what will be said over and over again within the pages of this book, paradise is a myth. Jesus found this out after his terrible death, which we believe he positively welcomed and went into quite deliberately. He was in for a deep, a deep and bitter disappointment, as, and many have found the same thing before him. May we say here once more that we all personally knew Jesus, uh, Jesus and lived alongside him, and in the end rose up against him and his government. Our chapter about him is given in truth from personal experience. There are rest plains of great and everlasting beauty where millions upon billions of people of all types live, many of them who have been there too long and have only one hope to live again, preferably in a modern beautiful planet, and not one such as yours must have been through all the previous centuries until even beyond Queen Victoria's reign, and most certainly in Queen Elizabeth I's. Both of these queens will give their personal message in the book, and I have read it, actually, it's quite interesting. Life after death is meant to be a rest between lives and should never last more than one or perhaps two or three hundred years. If the basic planet is destroyed through ignorance, war or pestilence of one sort or another, it will either be become completely fallow for perhaps a million or more years and be completely useless for habitation, or it will lose all of its beautiful cities, its scientists, doctors and men of knowledge and simply revert back to being a wilderness, which is quite obvious to us has happened many, many times before in this planet which must have been habitable for something like three or four or perhaps more hundred millions of years. Anyone with the ability for simple calculation and with some careful observation of the Earth's surface can come to imagine the number of civilizations which have possibly risen up and died away in that long, t long, long time. We believe millions. Millions upon millions have come, possibly to ever greater knowledge and power than your civilization has now. And through a lack of effort to save them from people of our, on our structure, they have either destroyed themselves or withered away and died. In the 12 carefully prepared chapters, we shall explain everything. We believe that the living need to know. 
As has been said already, everything you need to know is simple and logical. Such, such mysteries as there are, you need no knowledge of. Life after death and dying itself, which everyone must experience in the end, must be explained. And many of those who have experienced it and are with us here will speak and describe that life after death is like and what their own deaths were like. We must explain the creation of man, how it works, how reincarnation is perhaps the most important truth that has been withheld from humanity. We must explain how the family clans of humanity split and divided and intermarried together are so very important. A simple explanation about the universe itself, how it works, its vast size, and how its work has to go on constantly like a network throughout the universe to keep living humanity in circulation. There must be many throughout the universe who must work without cessation to help to populate empty planets, find new planets for those who have lost their physical homes. The importance of race and how Darwin's theories were so nearly right but not completely so. Health and how simple common plants and vegetables have still got drugs as yet unknown to help humanity. How we how to be healthy. Not one of those who at this present time make millions from their theories have got the complete answer, as they themselves, even eminent doctors in your planet, and this is where they were saying, um, are abysmally ignorant. The planting of the world's surface, how it works, if done incorrectly and ignored century after century, eventually destroys the world's weather until some new pattern can emerge, again, in natural regrowth, and sometimes fearsome animals must be created. This is their dinosaurs, I think, to destroy vegetation where it should not be. Their task done, they die, and hopefully new vegetation, and most precious of all, trees, slowly regrow to set the natural order of things to rights. Employment and how mankind must be employed in a thoroughly advanced, computerized world. How some races must work very hard to keep their planet in operation. But for others of all races, a simple life. They can never work much, if at all, as it is all part of their slow progression of humanity in many, many lifetimes. We want living people to consider the history of this planet and its people, their migrations in the last few thousands of years, and how this has affected the people all over the world today. The world's resources, how they must be conserved and not wasted in mere transportation, in that they're talking about oil. The new airships of the future, and I seem to have brought something with me about um, flight and how to make a water-based engine, but... It's, you know, that's um, not, not for now. The new sh airships of the future, how they will be constructed, how it is water, the separation of water, and the various important experiments which will all be carefully explained to create simple generating machines based on the gyroscope principle, which are the key to cheap, almost free power for the future. Desolation of the world's surface with vast dams is not only unnecessary and costly, but in many places it's extremely dangerous. The placing of vast buildings, concrete roads upon the Earth's surface. At the moment, this has not yet come to become dangerous, although slight tremors have already been felt. In unusual, in unusual places like the north of England, Sweden, etc., in the future, this knowledge must also be put to important use and far greater care be exercised in the building of enormous projects for future generations of people as yet unborn. Human beings ought to be happy, yet very few are. The deepest happen happiness comes from the, fa the human family. And the growth... And then I think, I'm afraid, I've lost the last page. So, oh, no, wait, here it is. In loving memory of all different and various family clans, a truly happy marriage, the basis of all new life, this is true happiness and goes on in life after death. Young people of today desperately need help to find the right partner for life, and this we intend to talk about in depth. There, I've, I've, I've read this already, haven't I? So, that's very... I mean, there's so much more. I, I, I think I've probably spoken enough, really. <laughs> that they are starting a communist mm. section where there's no power for the ordinary person. And I feel that Nigel Farage is right. You know, that in the end, all we will have is civil de disobedience. And then do we want to end up, like most of the people in Europe seem to have these Star Wars troops coming out of nowhere, all dressed in black with skid lids on, spraying them with pepper spray and water cannon, is that democracy? I didn't think it really is. At least Theresa May got um, Boris Johnson to send them back. I now think to uh, Boris Johnson. However, we'll see where we go. 
But I think that it, we all need to start thinking about who we marry, how things go forward. We th I think we, th we need to stop thinking about racism. Nobody is bad. Every one of us has been black at some point. And I'm sure I came up through the Arab nations. I'm very sort of predisposed to that kind of civilization. I'm sure I've been on crusade at some point in my life. And I do a lot of yoga, and I find a lot of these East... There's a tremendous amount of knowledge in the East, and we need to start looking at what these people have. I mean, I'm very interested in Ayurvedic medicine. And as for acupuncture, I'm finding that incredible. And I went and did the collective learning. It's called the Yellow Emperor. And the first thing that Professor Jerome Jiang said, we believe this was given to us by a very ancient, very technologically advanced nation many thousands of years ago. We don't know when, and we've lost most of the knowledge. So I think now all this knowledge is coming out, and we need to find it. So I'm digging around, trying to find my bit, and I hope everybody else will do the same. So I hope I've piqued your interest. I'm having my book... Um, prepared for, and I'm going to do it through social media, because I think, not that I know anything about it, which means I've got to um, remember my um, password for Facebook, and I've got to have a picture on there, and I've got to have to do LinkedIn from time to time. You know, every so often I see you have umpteen notifications, and I press the thing, and it comes up, and it says pass, and I have no clue, and I never look at it, so I'm absolutely hopeless. However, somebody will have to do that for me, and um, anyway... Blessings, everybody. Any, uh, any questions? Any questions? Right, there's a microphone for this. Um, if you could sort of haul this thing down. Right. right. If you could. I read this, or it was your mother's work, I looked at it years, but you said you know what makes a homosexual man choose to live that way. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that? Elaborate, yes. Please. It, I don't think that one just... I think war and the Catholic Church are the two biggest things. There are lots... If, if we really look at so many people's lives... I mean, today we're so free, but, you know, in the past... You know, you think of, of, of the sort of life a Roman soldier had... If he had any family, he left them long. You know, he left them behind. His life was spent completely with men. If you go to, if if you think of the emotions, I believe also that war is another thing which causes autism and things in people. If you think of the emotions that would be inspired in a man when he's in the middle of a battle. You think that he is sort of um, sitting there quietly thinking, where am I going with my life, you know? You, and then suddenly you have to go into battle and you, you take that experience away and all you've got is... <coughs> How many gay men go to these um, clubs where there are a stack of other men and music and noise and that's exciting? A lot of men came back from the First World War having formed tremendous friendships with other men. They had, you know, it was a life-changing thing. You survived somehow. You come back very changed mentally. And the women of the past who were perhaps doing a little bit of charity work or, you know, maybe they were in service, they had no experience of anything and they had no experience of what their men had been through. And so often those men turned back to themselves. There are, you, know, you think of, there are some men who perhaps were hacked to pieces in terrible wars of the past, in 6th, 7th century, who had had no children at all, end up on the other side forever and ever, and then perhaps come back and go to these Carmelite monasteries, where again, they're with other men. They're spent, they spend their time in prayer. They've, so this, unfortunately, is a big basis of homosexuality, no experience of women, and war. It also has to be said that in some of my mother's dictations, it says it has been visited upon some people who have preyed on others. Only, but w I think that there are, I mean, people like, um, say, for instance, um, Peter Tatchell, who I'm rather an admirer of. 
Now, Peter Tatchell, my, my only knowledge that I have of Peter Tatchell was that he was, do you know, um, was it um, Isabel, is it Isabel and Eloise, or I'm trying to think. Anyway, 10th century. Poor man, he had an affair with a girl he was supposed to be teaching music to. I think his, her uncle was the Bishop of Paris. He had him castrated. So he then went and um, joined a monastery. And I think that he, he was always known for being a marvelous man who would fight against what he didn't believe in. But I think he spent years and years and years going back into religious lives. I don't think he's preyed on anybody. I don't think he's been a bad person at all. I think he's a very good person. But he, he even now lives on practically nothing in a very austere way, as though he's been a monk. So I think it's over periods of time. And you look at how much homosexuality there was in Roman times and also in... Um, the Greek times and um, the, Spart the, in the Spartans actually encouraged, they took the, ch the small boys away from their parents, from the mother, at five, and they were encouraged to have a male partner and to fight and to be, to thieve, and to, they encouraged them literally to be soldiers. So many men have gone through that. The trouble is that one of the things that I've written very much in, in the book, sex is a very important thing. Because when you, you know, um, this is something I was reading actually in Love Sang Rampa, and they were saying, you know, you look sometimes on the side of the temples, and you see some really pornographic stuff with these people having sex together, and you think, it's really a bit irregular. However, what it's trying to say is that when, you, when your body functions on the same sort of electrical frequency and you have a meeting of minds and you have a real love and sexual experience with another person, that is supposed to be something which moves you forward in life. So generally you find that two women together and two men together actually take their spiritual power. So the, um, which is a shame for them because they're not bad people, it's just the way it is. But if you see a man who has had many lifetimes as a, as a, um, as a homosexual, um, we can think of lots of them in the media, they're, you know, the, um, the picture of them is not a strong manly man. And women tend to make each other more butch. So men together destroy their, well, having sex together, destroy their sexual power, their, their entity, their, their physical power, and women together destroy their, their power. Although they, it's now in the, in the, um, in the media, they make a big, they're making a big thing about it. I think there is a passage in the Bible, isn't it? A man who, you know, lays with another man is, it, you know, is, is as, becomes their stone or whatever it is. I can't remember the thing now. I'm not... I haven't read the Bible. However, so, but the, it, that's the same for these poor, unfortunate men who have, um, who have sex changes. That also, too, through no fault of their own, through probably some greedy parent who was very poor and thought, right, my little boy, if I have him castrated, you know, he's, I'm going to make money. He's going to be a castrati. He'll go and work in the church. And most of them ended up as lay, lay brothers, um, ruined men, and very unhappy so that's generally, but uh, there's a great big long chapter about it because I think it's something that we all really very much need to understand. Does that okay. answer your question? No. Uh, no. Okay, right. Okay, if you want to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mentioned about uh, the sort of abuse cycles the planet's been involved with over a lot of our recorded history. Sorry, say that again? Sorry, talking about you know, the abuse uh, cycles the planet's been trapped in for yeah. a number of uh, generations. Um, I was wondering if anything in your mother's book was over how people tend to protect their abusers. And I was wondering if there's anything uh, in your mother's writings about how we escape that cycle of abuse and protecting abuse. What do you mean individual abuse or abuse of the planet? Or even collectively, on a collective, on a collectively as well, we, uh, we protect our abusers, generally we ignore things we don't have to deal with uh, psychologically it's in something that we tend to do I, t I tend to uh, have, have, have experienced that myself until recently I, I tend to ignore a lot of the um, 
abuse structure as it in my own personal life. So I would imagine on a, on a collective scale, it's a similar thing. I was wondering if there's anything your know, mother's writing about oh, escaping those abuse cycles. Um, to be quite honest, I think there is. But um, I've really got to sit down and do it. There's so much to say. I think really they want a medical book done, which includes... Um, you know, how the body works, the spirit, life after death, um, different herbal medicines. Um, they want, there, there is a lot about, about sex, which is, and how important it is to humanity. And um, I think I have put something in, in the, the, my chapter about homosexuality. I, I, don't I don't want anything to be too negative about things. I think everybody, there's not, there is no person who is all bad. Whatever they do, there are good things. Even gangsters that, you know, have done terrible things. There have been good things about them. And w nobody is ever wasted. We have to move forward. And um, we're, I, we're going we're gonna to have to finish. Yeah, finish uh, I can talk one, to you one, about it later. One more, one more question. To, okay. okay. One more. Just wanted, do you want to get that in? One, uh, no. Our right. dinner, our dinner is awaiting. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Right, I can take this postule off my cheek. It's not a postule. Okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that that will be lunch uh, until uh, it's one thirty now, so it'll be at two thirty going on three o'clock, quarter to three probably when we start with Vanessa Bates. <laughs>